Mayor's Night Out in the 5th District. Uh, I want to thank Purdue County, uh, Purdue County Med Chancellor Tom Keon. Well, I'm not sure, is, I think he's out of town today. But I wanted to thank Purdue County Met for setting up for us. I believe this is the first time, maybe the second time we've done Purdue County Met. Do you remember? We might have done the center. It's the first time we've done it in here. So I wanted to thank Purdue County Met for letting us host this. So I want to remind everybody this is host, uh, this is being shown live, right, right, on Go Hammond TV. Uh, so you guys can get home and watch it again if you want to. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out. I'd like to introduce Leanne Munoz, who's Special Events Coordinator for the City of Hammond. Hey, Leanne. Well, while you're fixing that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the 5th District Councilman, Michael Pinker, so he can give you a welcome to his district. Let's give it up for the 5th District Councilman, Michael Pinker. Thank you, Mayor, and welcome, all you folks, uh, on this hot and humid Wednesday evening. Uh, I'd first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you guys again for coming. Uh, I'd like to go over a couple things that are going on in the 5th District on a couple plans that we got. Actually, we got a lot of plans coming up. Uh, first of all, as you noticed, if you've been down southeastern, we finally completed that lighting project. Uh, that was about five years in the making, but we are able to complete that. Uh, plants coming up, four lights. Uh, North Cot from 167th, southeastern. That's a lighting project that's in the makings. Dalmore and Belmont, 7700 block. Lighting project scheduled for that. Uh, Beach, 7400 to 7600 lighting project. And also Lindbergh, 6,900 to 7,300 lighting project. As far as street projects, Martha and Alcott, 167th to 169th. We have that designed and ready to go. We're just waiting for funds, as everyone else is. Alexander in between 167th and Martha. And then the 7,400 block of Delaware, Orchard Drive to the dead end. Uh, if you've been down 171st in between Lindbergh and Wicker, you know if, uh, it's kind of shut down. They're putting handicapped in that area and sidewalks and redoing that area for uh, handicapped people for, um, you know, to get to, to and from Purdue Cal. Also, uh, there are a number of sidewalk projects throughout the 5th District. I'm not going to list them all. And one thing I wanted to mention to all you folks, uh, you are familiar with the 311 app. If you do have a problem in your area, you, you can't, um, you know, you can take a picture of it with that 311 app and send that in. That's a very great tool that's working, working out very well for the city. So like I said, use that. And, and if you don't have a phone to do that, you know, just give us a call like you normally do and uh, we'll get on it. As far as new businesses, Buffalo Wild Wings, since we last spoke, is now open and going. It's one of the top, um, top Buffalo Wild Wings in the Midwest. We also got the new Walmart, which opened last um, last Wednesday on the 20th. We got a brewery coming in over by uh, Buffalo Wild Wings, also Hampton Inn Hotel. And there's also a three-story professional business center that's gonna be going up. Other than that, I'll be around after the meeting if you have any questions, and we'll go from there. Other than that, I'd like to turn it over to the mayor. Thank you, Councilman Mike. As you all know, we've been doing Mayor's Night Out. We started my first two terms doing it 12 months a year. And then we figured out the summertime months were always a lot slower. So we cut it down to once every other month. We've been doing that for the last, geez, four years. So, uh, uh, Leanne Munoz, why don't we go ahead and introduce the department head? John Amuda, Hammond Park. Patrick Carver, Economic Development. Bruce uh, Hammond Water. Chris Cantor, Law Department. Chris Campbell, Information Technology. Oana Miller, Community Development. Nicole Sullivan, Hammond Port Authority. Chris Sacalaris, Legal Aid. Anna Gray, City Controller. John Doty, Hammond Police Department. Mark McLaughlin, Chief of Staff. Sam Destotny, City Engineer. Kurt Cook, Building. <laughs> Marty Wolgus, Hammond Sanitary District. Jack Smith, Sewer Department. Dennis Radowski, United Neighborhood Team. Brian Poland, City Planning. Kelly Kearney, Golden Fortune. Karen Daniels, Personnel. Kevin Margrath, Fire Department. Gary Gleason, Public Works. Michelle Sullivan, Housing. Leanne Munoz, Park Department. 
It seems that the uh, mobile microphone's not very loud today, so we're going to have to talk loud when we're talking on that. Thank goodness Leanne's not very shy. Um, I want to tell everybody the next Mayor's Night Out is scheduled for Wednesday, August 26th. It's going to be at Eggers Middle School. And I also want to remind everybody that the City of Hammond's annual flower giveaway is this Saturday at the Gene Shepherd Center uh, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at where our supplies last. You must be a Hammond resident with a proof of ID or a license, proof of ID or a license to get the flowers. City of Hammond's annual flower giveaway is this Saturday at the Gene Shepherd Center right here in the 5th District. Uh, I also want to thank the elected officials in attendance. First off, I'd like to thank 3rd District Councilman Anthony Higgs. Thank you very much, Councilman. Hammond's 4th District Councilman Bill Emerson. Thank you very much, Bill. First, 5th District Councilman Michael Pinker. Councilman at large, Dan Spitali. Councilwoman at large, Janet Venez. And quickly scanning the audience to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Okay. Um, he's uncontested in the 6th District, so I'm going to call him Councilman elect Scott Rickles. Welcome to the crowd, Scott. All right. Uh, this is a process that's driven by written questions. I have Courtney and Jill in the very back. You guys raise your hand. They have written questionnaires. Thank you very much. Energetic raise of hand. Um, you ask a question, you bring it back to them, and then I'll start a topic. So let's say you ask a question about lighting in the 5th District. Uh, we would have a topic about lighting in the 5th District, and we would talk about the process. The councilman would probably talk. But basically, if you had another question about lighting in the 5th District, you can raise your hand. So we try to stay on topic. Let's say the topic is South Shore. If you raised your hand and you wanted to have a complaint about garbage, that would be something that we'd probably start with a new question. Okay? We've been doing this for a while. I think most people are used to it by now. Uh, I think we only have a few questions which is fine with me, and I think it's fine with most of my staff, but I want to let you know that this process is generated by questions, so if you want to keep it going, we need more questions in the back. Maybe they're not asking questions because the Blackhawks are playing at 7 o'clock tonight, so no pressure. <laughs> Cubs are playing and the Blackhawks are playing. It's a rare occasion, so uh, maybe we'll get done by then, but you know, we'll keep answering questions until they're done. So, Leanne, let's go ahead and start with the first. Okay, so the first question is about the water department new meters. Okay. Who's here? Is Ed here? Oh, hey Ed, what's going on? We have to do something about that microphone. It's brutal. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that the uh, the gentlemen that come to do the job are very efficient. They're 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 uh, less than 15 minutes, and they're very courteous. But please be very careful of who you let in your house. It's been many years ago. One of my neighbors was robbed by somebody saying. They wanted to check the water in the house. And in Chicago, you know, they're claiming that they're checking for gas leaks and doing the same thing. What was that? Is that Ed? Yeah. Right. Really? Can you talk on yours anymore? No. Hey, look at that. So good. Sounds really good now. <laughs> All right, so uh, I think we got the, the gist of your question, sir. I want to remind everybody that the Hammond Water Department right now sent a, a, a postcard out to a lot of its customers saying basically we're going to some type of Wi-Fi monitoring where the water meter, the readers of the water meter no longer have to go into the house to read it anymore. If you get this new meter installed, we do have safety precautions we want to let Hammond residents know. Uh, so I'm going to pass off to the CEO of the Hammond Water Company, Ed Cruza. Ed, Talk about the type of identification that your water department personnel carry with them. Uh, and if they're asked to provide ID, your people, the people that work for you, aren't going to have a problem with that, right? I have a feeling Ed's not going to be using a microphone today. Can we do something about this? Yeah. One seems to be having a problem, so. Um, the water department will send you a letter if you're scheduled to get the new meter. The meters are uh, have an electronic device so that the meter readers don't have to go and read the outside controller anymore. They can walk by the house and their handheld device reads the meter automatically. So they don't have to come in the house, they don't have to do anything. As far so as it only takes, are you just doing it in certain neighborhoods right now? I know I got the postcard. It said contact the water department if you want your meter changed out. 
for doing your neighborhood? Are you just doing targeted we neighborhood? We had a regular rotation to, um, to change out meters, so we've continued on that rotation. And we schedule appointments so that it's convenient for people after work or during the day if they work in the evening. And a letter is sent and a phone call, maybe a backup uh, follow-up phone call. And the individual that will come to install the meeting, uh, the meter, um, will have ID, name tag, and if there's ever any questions, we tell everybody, even on our monthly bill, call the water department. If someone shows up and says we're from the water department and you have your doubts, or even if you don't have any doubts, you can always call the water department 24 hours a day and ask, is someone from the water department supposed to be here? And we will answer your questions. Okay. So they have water department IDs, they have water department, you know, they're wearing the uniform of the water department. Correct. And it's set up prior to, right? Yes, correct. They're not just going to knock on your door and say, hey, I'm here to change yeah, our meter. They're not going to do that at all. The letter is sent out, the appointment is scheduled, follow-up calls are made. And your, in your process, you're expecting this to take a few years, true? Yes, this is going to be a 10-year um, process. 10-year so process. We're installing 2,800 meters a year. Um, First year we install a little bit more, almost 3,200. Okay. All right. Does that answer your question, sir? Anybody have any questions about the new water meters, and Water Department? All right. It was eventful, but we got through the first question. I think we're just going to keep that one off. Probably. So, a good idea. If um, there are some questions on this side, just bear with me while I run over there. Um, I think we have some other questions coming, but right now I would like to um, make an announcement for some of the, uh, there's a few anniversaries in the city. Um, one of them is Jake, Jake up right here. Jake and Karen Jacob <laughs> celebrated their 43rd wedding anniversary today. His what? I... 43rd wedding anniversary today. Oh. So congratulations, Happy anniversary. Jake. Jake, you're spending it with us, how romantic. And second are Jeff and Christina Massey. They're celebrating their 15th wedding anniversary. Yay. Nice to see you guys. So congratulations. Thank you. And just one moment while I get some questions for you. We always encourage people to share their anniversaries with me on Mayor's Night Out. So it's a, it's a very common place. OK, now we have some questions. All right. This is for our planning and development. The old Walmart on 165th, what's going to happen to it? What about the park semi? It's a possible problem. Is it something that we can address today? Who is responsible for security at the old Walmart? Park semi is at the old Walmart. Uh, why don't we uh, address that one the chief of police first off? Yeah. That one should be good. <laughs> That's good, good, good. That one's good. Okay. Um, first of all, many of the stores, uh, the property owners, they go back and forth because it's private property on whether they, they make the decision whether semis are going to be allowed to park there or not. Uh, they very often can become a nuisance, we found. Um, I won't mention names of some big box retailers. They've uh, definitely gone the way of eventually banning trucks on their property. But until the property owner decides to do that, uh, we do not get involved. So if I'm Cabela's, for instance, or Super Walmart, I could say, private property, I want somebody to park on my property. Correct. And there's nothing we can do about it. Nothing we can do about it. They have to call it. It's not overnight. It can't be camped out for like five days there. Right. No right. Normally, normally, a lot of retailers, if they're not using that space, try to initially be courteous to the truckers coming through the area. Uh, sometimes it backfires on them, mm -hmm. and then they'll call us. And they'll say, hey, we put a ban on that, and then we enforce that for them. Gotcha. But we need to be invited onto the property. Gotcha. Okay. So in regards to the old Walmart, does anybody know if that allows for semi-parking or not? Chris, do you know? I mean, Walmart's traditional for letting, like, RVs park when it's an open business, uh, but there's not supposed to be any overnight truck parking. I haven't noticed that. I mean, I live in the neighborhood, but I don't drive by Walmart all Yeah, the I mean, time. the parking lot is large enough to accommodate, let's say, a, a tractor trailer driver wanted to run in and buy some supplies. They can I think we're talking about the old Walmart, though, so there's... Right, right, that's what I'm saying. So, but they're not set up for overnight parking, even if it is an operational business, but it shouldn't be used as a parking lot now, either. Okay. 
Have you noticed that, Chief? Have we heard about anything about that? No, I, I know you probably won't be seeing that at the new Walmart because right. Cabela's prohibits that. And, it's and they have an agreement, I believe, a security agreement. Okay. Uh, as far as uh, the second half uh, security, there used to be Hammond Police and Lake County Security at the old Walmart, working in that building only on that entire property. Um, they're contracted uh, by Walmart. Uh, those officers have moved to the new Walmart. So there's at least, I can't answer whether it's their security or not. I believe there is a private firm that works the entire campus there, the retail campus, but the Hammond Police Department is no longer on the property, neither is Lake County. They've moved south. Okay. Now, uh, Africa, could you uh, talk about, uh, Africa is the head of economic development. I've, had, I've been asked a lot of questions about, obviously we're happy that the new Walmart opened. It's you know multi-million dollar project. It doubled the size of the workforce. It's going to be way busier, I imagine, than the old store. Now we have the old store completely vacant. You know, what's the plan for that, if you don't mind? We've been working with a developer that's very interested in the site. We have another meeting scheduled, I believe, next week. And we've been going back and forth with some different ideas for that location. So, Gosh, that thing so is. We're, definitely, we're definitely looking at ways to market the building, and there is interest. There right. is interest in the building. Okay. We do have a plan for that building, whereas we're working with the developer. Okay. If there's anybody that knows how to fix that microphone, this would be the time because it sounds horrible. I mean, it sounds like we're underwater. Can I get a speaker? Is it, um... Okay. After a roaring start. Sorry, everybody. All right. Okay, um, the second question is, can route markers be installed alerting where riders can board the GPTC bus traveling through Hammond and surrounding areas? Still broke. Chris, could you do something? Somebody? No, no, no. No, like, this has to be fixed. What's that? This mic is like the super mic. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, everybody. This should have been checked before we got here, and it obviously wasn't. So. Let's gonna keep that one unplugged. Okay. You can utilize this one um, for now. Um, so again, the question was, uh, can route markers be installed alerting where riders can board the GPTC bus traveling through Hammond and surrounding areas? And are there any plans to resume public mass transportation through Hammond? GPTC is its own independent agency. Uh, it's run, it's funded with taxpayers from Gary uh, through a fund from NERPC. This is not being paid for by Hammond residents, not being paid for by Hammond taxpayers, other than through your federal taxes that go to NERPC. Um, you know, I, I think any questions about GPTC would have to be directed to them. If you want to talk about the bus issue, we can talk about that. But as far as GPTC, I can't really answer for them because we don't run them. So does anybody have a follow-up question they want to do with that? Whatever question that was, I mean, Route markers aren't really handled by the city of Hammond, they're handled by GPTC. Anybody want to follow up on that question? I get asked questions about busing a lot. Um, you know, the city council, I want to remind everybody that Hammond pays three and a half million dollars every year into the Regional Development Authority. The RDA has responsibility, one of the tenants of one of its areas of jurisdiction is busing. They have chosen at the RDA not to support regional busing. Um, which sort of pushes back on us that we have the option, I guess, of paying three and a half million to the RDA, watching them ignore busing, and then we have the option of paying another million or so on top of that to try to fix the buses or to, to try to fund it ourselves, or we could try to insist that the RDA fund busing properly. Is that your question, John? Sure. Uh, I was in the meeting when Dan Repay met with the, R R the people from the uh, RBA, and they said that they, the agreement, I was sitting in that con that caucus meeting when they had the meeting, and they promised if we turned the buses over to them, they would keep funding it, and they dumped us. 
Not you. They did. Well, that when that agreement was talked about? Yeah, we, uh, the city of Hammond gave $2 million to the RBA and all of our buses. And at the time, they were supposed to find a permanent funding source for the regional buses, which I thought was the answer, which is why we supported it. The Hammond City Council and the mayor worked together, gave them the proper funding, and they made it work for about two and a half years. And they were ignored by the state government. They were ignored by county government. And they had no funding source. The only bus route in Northwest Indiana with a permanent funding source is GPTC, funded with Gary taxpayer money. So their Gary taxpayers are paying for those buses to go through Hammond. The Gary taxpayers are paying for buses to go down to Merrillville and Crown Point. They're not being paid for with Hammond taxpayer money at all. What should happen is that our DA, Regional Development Authority, should fund busing themselves. I dare say if we had a Democratic governor, they would be funding busing right now. We have a Republican governor, the Republican legislature that doesn't believe in busing, regardless of how we feel about it, and they have given marching orders to the RDA, even though they could fund it, that they are not going to fund it. So we have the option of a further penalty in Hammond of paying another million or so. It was a million when we got rid of it. I don't know if that's still the case, but we don't own any buses, so we'd have to go out and buy buses. We'd have to hire employees to drive those buses. We'd have to buy gas. We'd have to pay for repairs. We'd have to have a place to store them. And then we'd have to follow federally mandated route requirements. And it would cost us well over a million dollars a year, which would just add to the problems Councilman O'Faker was talking about earlier. That he feels pressure, and I know Councilman Higgs does, and just like Councilman Emerson does, they feel pressure to use casino gaming revenue for its intended purpose, which is infrastructure. And if we keep on adding to the city budget, then there's going to be that much less money to pay for the infrastructure improvements we need. It's a tough problem. You know, I think the RDA should step up and pay for busing and, and provide regional busing throughout the entire region. But it doesn't really matter what I think because they have their own marching orders and that's to ignore busing. And we're sort of in a stalemate. Um, East Chicago provides busing, they pay for it. So they pay RDA plus busing in East Chicago. Gary pays for busing, so they pay RDA plus busing. Keep in mind that they're asking us to also pay for the, the train on top of that. So in East Chicago, it would be RDA plus busing plus train money. And then Gary, Gary Mayer has indicated she's willing to pay 300000 a year. So it's 300000 plus all the costs of busing plus the $3.5 million she pays to the RDA. I think the council and the mayor in Hammond have it right. Take our money out of the $3.5 million. Take our train money out of the $3.5 million. Take our busing money out of the $3.5 million. We, I'd like to think we're getting something for the three and a half million we paid at the RDA. Why should we have the bus tax on top of that? Why should we have the train tax on top of that? I think we need busing. But we pay three and a half million dollars a year every year to the RDA, and they could do it. They've chosen not to. It's a stalemate, you know, and unfortunately it's the disabled and the poor that are caught, caught in the middle. And it's, it's horrible. It's a horrible situation, and it should be handled differently. And quite frankly, we're not the only part of Indiana that whose busing needs are being ignored. We're not the only part of Indiana. Indianapolis is going through the same types of issues right now. It's a state that does not support public transportation. For the poor, we have no problem supporting a $600 million commuter rail line, though. I mean, why don't we split off a fraction of that $600 million rail line and pay for busing for 30 years? You know, that's just, it's a weird thing. We're gonna pay $600 million for a rail line, but we're not gonna have buses to get to the rail line. I mean, how much would it cost to run busing? Cost us about a million dollars a year, you know? That's $600 million we're talking about. You can run buses for a long time on that kind of money. So it's a tough situation. I'm willing to talk about it. I just don't know if anybody has any other questions. I don't know if I answered the question the right way. Yes, ma'am. I'm afraid to have you speak into a microphone, so. <laughs> and I'm poor anyway because of my allergies. It's okay. My name is Sarah Mack. I'm the one who asked the question. I work for the Impact Program, what used to be known as the Welfare to Work Program okay. for the state of Indiana. A lot of our clients come from Illinois because the cost of living is lower here in Indiana. However, they feel stuck as far as finding employment because there is, the busing is limited. So it's a challenge that we face every day in the office, we can tell them about a job, 
but they're not going to have the same access to transportation right. like they had in Illinois. It's a catch-22. But one of the reasons the cost of living is lower in Indiana is because our state doesn't allow us to spend money very easily. That's one of the reasons people are moving here is because it's a cheap place to live because we have low taxes. And then when you get here, you're like, my God, look at the potholes. You know, how come we can't get any lighting projects done? How come we don't have buses? It's like, if we started doing everything Illinois does, our property taxes would rise and people would start moving the other way, you know? It's, it's a catch-22, it really is, but it's frustrating for me because I know enough about this to be dangerous. I know when the RDA, and I'm throwing all these acronyms at you, the Regional Development Authority was only created about eight or nine years ago. I was mayor then, and I was in the state house, and they said, Mayor, we're gonna create the RDA, and you're gonna save a million dollars a year on busing because we're gonna take it over, and we're gonna expand the train line, and you're not gonna have to pay for it, and we're gonna still be able to do these great park projects and everything, you know? And, and everybody else got asked to join the RDA. They said, no, we can't ask you. You are joining. We're not asking. We're gonna take your money, but look at all the great things you get for it. And then they create it, and one of the first things they say is, we're not paying for buses. And there was no rail line eight years ago. Now it's a rail line. And what are they doing? They're not using the three and a half million for it. They're saying, okay, pay your three and a half million. If you want buses, you gotta pay for that too. But we also want 900,000 a year for 30 years to pay for the train. What the heck am I paying for then? I'm paying three and a half million dollars a year. So is East Chicago, so is Gary, so is Lake County. You know, Gary, East Chicago, and Hammond, we can point to something we got out of the RDA project. All the stuff that we did up around Wolf Lake and up along the lakeshore, that's RDA projects, which is great. But what does Lake County receive for its $35 million? And the buses, it's a travesty. It really is. It's a stalemate. And it's unfortunate that clients like yours, they get caught in the middle, man. And it's a horrible situation. And I guess we could fold and we could say, okay, here's another million, million and a half a year, and then we're gonna run buses like was when I took over, which is a bus that just goes around the city of Hammond, which doesn't necessarily solve all of our problems. I think your clients wanna get in a bus in Hammond, maybe they wanna to go to Dyer for a job, or maybe they wanna to go to Crown Point. The city. That's not possible the way we did it when I first took over. It's like, you can get on a bus in one part of the city and go to another part. Okay. Yeah, it's a tough situation. I appreciate the question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, North Township Dial Ride is a bus service that's on demand. It's not for regular visits, not like, hey, I want to go once a week to school or something. I guess they could do that kind of stuff. It's more like medical visits and stuff like that, right? So, anybody know the contact for Frank Murvan's Dial Ride? What's that, 932? Thank you, Anthony. 932-2530, North Township Dial Ride. Okay. All right, we haven't blown up any speakers lately, so we're off to a roaring start. So far, so good. Yeah. Uh, this next question is for engineering. Chicago Avenue near Bishop Knowles Athletic Fields need repair. Are there any plans to do so? <laughs> this is almost like it's, it's, a, it's a great question. How are you doing, Stan? We're doing a big project. It's almost like somebody knew. Shut this mic off because we were worried that maybe this was part of the problem. Sounds uh, okay. Chicago Avenue is under design right now. We are designing it from, from the East Chicago City limits uh, to Sheffield Avenue, including Sheffield Avenue over to Goslin and Goslin over to the state line. We are probably going to bid late this year or very early next year the segment of Chicago Avenue that actually runs from White Oak Avenue at uh, East Chicago to uh, Calumet Avenue. That'll be a total rebuild of the street with uh, any appropriate infrastructure, lighting, and it'll, it'll, it'll bring it up to snuff. Uh, over the next two to three years, we're gonna rebuild the balance of the road. So it'll be totally reconstructed. It's gonna totally change the look of that neighborhood i think it's really going to be positive it's about a 30 million dollar project to rebuild the whole section plus the additional right of way thank you um so that's that project is going to take a while we uh went through that real closely with the first and the second district councilman at the time it's a it's a, an amazing project but especially on the west end there's a lot of property acquisition there's a lot of demolition that needs to take place on the east end over by bishop Knoll. that's the part we're going to start with first right yeah, that's the easiest part because there's very little right of way. Okay. But on the other end, we're going to put some traffic circles in. There's some 
there's some landscaping, there's a center media, and it's going to make a very attractive entrance into the city from Illinois. Okay. Any follow-ups on that question? No, but thank you. Thank you. All right. Two questions. Thank you. All right. Okay. This next question is for code enforcement. There are two foreclosed houses on the 6300 block of Moraine. Who mows the lawn? Is it a city contract? And what is the foreclosure rate in Hammond? Let me start off, okay? First off, you can answer. This app, Hammond 311, is something that we've been promoting a lot. It's, a, it's an app that you can download on your smartphone, on your Android, or on your, uh, your smartphone, Android or iPhone, or you can get it on your home personal computer. Um, it allows you to report issues like uh, long grass, graffiti, things like that. It's a great app. It's free to download. It goes directly to, in this case, it would be code enforcement. So let's say it's your next door neighbor and they don't cut their grass. You can take a picture of their grass. You could submit it anonymously. You don't have to submit it under your own name. The GPS in there will know exactly where that was taken from. You can put an address on there and say long grass. That, as soon as you hit send, will go straight to Kelly Kearney, who handles it from there. Kelly, could you talk a little bit about this? Depending on whose area it is, um, the inspectors and inspectors are one through six, so if it's the first district, fifth district could be that inspector. I want to mention that um, new inspector, Tom Novak, actually put a, a tab on her Facebook page, Inspections Department, City of Hammond. Um, if you go to there, there's a, a see, click, fix tab that you can click on to and follow it on Facebook also. Um, I think that's going to be very popular. Um, we're familiar with those properties on Forest. I, I'm very familiar with them. Um, everything's been either tagged or cited or in the process of getting cut. We have court up today on Wednesday. Um, a lot of those cut and cleans are going to be ordered today. Um, also tomorrow from Judge Harkin. Uh, a lot of them will be issued then. Some first Is that cuts. a standing order for the whole season? No, once we get the cuts, we're able to cut it throughout the season. We yeah, so if my neighbor never cuts his grass and you put a green sticker on the window that says that we know about it. Fair? Correct. That's a, it's a visual indicator to the neighbors that are worried that we're on this, right? Correct. And then what you're doing is waiting to get into court so you can get permission to get onto the property. Once we get the green tag on it, it's basically a 10-day notice. If it's vacant, no one's cutting it, we can go ahead and cut that property. Some of those are what's going now. Vacant lots are being cut now. How much would, it, would you charge to cut my lawn? Because it might be cheaper just to go with you guys. You know? Well, and that's a good catch because um, in the past we've recorded every November. At the end of the season, we record it. And there's a there was a seventy five dollar fee for processing all the paperwork. We've increased that because a lot of people were, it seemed, so like, hey, it's pretty nice lawn service, right? They come out here regularly. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, you know, and we don't have before, to pay for it because you just leave the property, right? Just before you re record it, they pay the bill and pay the seventy five or before they have to pay the seventy five dollars. Okay, so you fix that. We've increased that fee, we're gonna record twice. It's 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 not very cheap either. If I remember it's like hundred and fifty bucks to mow a lawn or something like that. It's, no, it's 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 reasonable. Um I don't want to tip my hand now. Everyone's going to be used to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's twenty-eight dollars for what we would consider a small lot. How much? Twenty-eight. Wow. I think yeah. I'm watching you. <laughs> <laughs> we spend a lot of money on cutting grass. Right. It's twenty-eight, thirty-three, and, and thirty-eight, depending on the size of the lot. And then what happens is, okay, so let's say it's a homeowner that lives in Florida and the, the house is abandoned and they just forgot about it. What you do is, if you cut it all summer long, you actually lien that amount to the property, right? Yes. We'll record that in August. We'll record that in August, and there's a $200 fee for that. And if it's not taken care of, if it's still not taken care of it, we'll record it again in November at the end of the season when we quit cutting it. There'll be another $200 fee for that. There's a lot of paperwork, a lot of processing, um, a lot of. Technically, it's not his job. This was supposed to be set up before we got here. Sorry, everybody. We're going to take a break.
I'm sorry, everybody. We're going to go ahead and keep going like this. I don't want anybody to touch this again. I'll find out exactly what happens right. tomorrow. I promise you I'll follow this up. Okay. So, again, we'll report it again in November, and, and uh, the fee will, another fee will be applied at that point. Um, we always try to get someone to cut it. We don't want to cut houses that are occupied. There's no reason for us to. Um, that's what the tag is for. Um, rental properties seem to be an issue where um, tenants don't take very good care of their property or, or good, well enough. Um, we have that rental registration information that gives us the opportunity to call a landlord and tell them, hey, you're going to be cited if you don't, your tenants don't cut it or if you don't get a lawn service to take care of it or someone doesn't take care of the property. Okay, so the long and the short of it is by seeing the green tag on the front window, you guys know about it. We cannot go on your property until we get permission from a court order, you know, because you can get in trouble for city workers going on private property. So once we get permission from Judge Harkin, we can go onto the property and we can cut it. So I'm really sorry about the sound. This is the first time in all the mayor's nights out we've ever done that this has actually happened. I will get to the bottom of it because I show up and I expect things to work and they're not working, which means that my staff is doing something wrong and I promise you I'll figure it out tomorrow, okay? All right, let's do the next question. Um, this next question is for the police department. I live on a street with Purdue parking, with the Purdue parking garage on the corner of 171st with the stop sign. There are continuous problems with students blowing the stop sign. There will be police department that responds once in a while, but I've noticed when they pull over one car, they do not come back. Okay. Steady. Um, I didn't quite hear it all because of the distortion, but uh, so it's stop sign. Let me see if I got it. Stop sign that's on 171st. Yes. At, at what intersection? By the Purdue Park Wicker. Garage. Okay. Um, well, our beat officers, uh, they do watch stop signs during the normal course of their duties. Um, they're obviously not going to camp out there um, if uh, because we have to cover a large area as well. If uh, However, I will ask them to pay some special attention to that area since it was brought up tonight. Um, Purdue also patrols all the time around the school and uh, they, they do the primary enforcement of the students around the school, 360 degrees there. They, uh, I'm not saying it's solely their responsibility, it's a shared responsibility, but they, uh, they are more available and there all the time. So I can pass a message on to them as well and ask for some help and maybe some extra enforcement over there. The current police chief at uh, Purdue County Met happens to be our old police chief, uh, Brian Miller. Uh, he has a very close relationship with John Doty, our current police chief. Um, and that gives us an extra advantage, I guess, that we're dealing with right around the school. So, is that your question, ma'am? It is, yes. Um, what would I have to do to possibly figure out if we can make a one way, like going out of the parking <laughs> garage? Because I know it sounds funny. No, but no, no, no. Honestly, we tried this. It's like a residential street, and it's all day long. I can't even get out of the driveway. I, I you know, it's funny. The reason I laugh. They just keep on going. When I first, street. when I first became mayor, we did a couple of traffic changes around the city. Okay, one of them worked. It was very successful. So we started getting cocky and looking at other parts of the city where we could do traffic changes like the one you're talking about that we thought would help neighborhoods. Okay, one of the proposals, and Stan was working real close with me at the time. One of the proposals was for Purdue County Met traffic to try to funnel it out easier, which would make 171st a one-way leaving, excuse me, Wicker, leaving Purdue Cal on Wicker, right? That would go one way to 169th. So everything coming out would go to 169th and go either direction at a controlled intersection. Um, it was, the thing is when you're looking at a neighborhood, you have to look at all the houses, okay? And let's say there's 100 houses in that immediate vicinity, about four of them were negatively affected. And 96 of them were positively affected by that proposal. And we approached the neighborhood, we talked about it, and that was rejected by the neighborhood. Stan, could you help me? I mean, Stan, could you jump in on this? Be very careful. Because I'm so scared to turn on any, all right. It's working. Uh, yeah, we tried it. We met with the residents and it just didn't work. They just couldn't all agree on it. They felt there was too much traffic actually getting funneled into it. And there was like a, like a continuous flow. We are always willing to look at solutions, but they're, but they're not always easy. That was a, a tough situation. Um, 
when we did the state line curve, it's the one I point to. We did two successful uh, traffic re reconfigurations. State line curve, which was wildly successful. Quite frankly, most of the neighborhoods support it. To this day, they still praise me for it when I go through those neighborhoods. And then Parkview up in Robertsdale, which is right off Forsyth Park. A lot of people don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but for those from that part of the city, we blocked the flow of traffic because it was being used as a shortcut, okay? We used it very successfully. And, and the interesting thing is, when you cut down on the, the amount of traffic going through a neighborhood like that, the crime stats follow suit. And you start noticing there's less crime committed in that neighborhood because criminals don't feel as comfortable being in that neighborhood because there's that much less traffic. Um, we approached this part of the city, which is my neighborhood. I live one minute drive from here. Um, we approached this part of the city with something we thought made sense and the neighborhood rejected it. And I was sort of stunned because I thought it was a real good solution and I realize it's busy in this part of the city with Purdue Cal traffic, but I also want to point out that Purdue Cal is a blessing for our city. It's the second largest employer in Hammond. It's a great university. And I mean, we're blessed in a lot of ways to have Purdue Cal here, but along with that blessing, it comes some negatives as well. One of them is traffic Monday through Friday, and it's, it's heavy. There's, you know there's 10,000 students that go to this school? Uh, yeah, they all drive down my street. <laughs> <laughs> I guess good. I'm affected more because I live on the corner. So the stop sign. You live on 171st, and, 171st and Wicker? Yes. Um, I know your house. If I stand there and like record the vehicles going by, it's probably eight out of 10 don't even slow down. Like they just go right through that stop sign. Yep. And I have children, so it does worry me. Right. Um, on top of there being the stop sign, the children at play sign, and everything else right. in front of my house. And know? then like the crazy lines for people that want to get onto. 173rd and turn east. Oh, yeah. And, and it just backs really up. It, if, if it backs up all the way down to your house, that's a real bad backup. But I imagine it has probably a couple It does times. all the time. Yeah, so it's tough. I agree. Way at those times, I don't do that either. But, right. You know, it's the stop sign really that bothers me the most um, because I see it all day long, I guess. Who's and, it goes up to his, Scott or... Hey, Scott. You care if you grab a microphone? Uh, this is Officer Scott Holbrook. Uh, he's the community affairs officer for this area. I know Scott's real good at the crime watches. Scott, we've been talking about Wicker. I'm not sure if you were listening. Uh, we were talking about Wicker and 171st and the stop sign at Wicker and 171st, how many people blow through it when they leave Purdue County Met. Um, I'm, I imagine you've heard this complaint a million times, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, that, that area does get a lot of traffic like we were talking. And uh, we, I know there's a lot of Purdue. The certain times when the classes are getting out or coming in, they do speed down that street. I definitely agree with you. I'll give you my card. You can give me a call or I can meet with you after the meeting. We can discuss it. and. Uh, like the chief said, we can definitely let patrol know, make extra passes out there. I can sit out there. Um, yeah, it's a short-term thing. A long-term, yeah, I don't know about the one way or whatever. Right, exactly. Hey, ma'am, you know, he's a good person for you to know. He's in charge. I mean, he's the liaison between the community and the Hamlet Police Department. Maybe you guys could get together and you could sort of express your frustrations to Scott. He's a great officer. That's why we put him in community affairs. I, pre I totally get what you're saying. I know exactly what you're talking about. I live on Knickerbocker on the other side of school, and I get the exact opposite. I get the cars going 50 miles an hour. And I'm not even kidding. It's a little park, Park Street. There are people and kids riding bikes and parking, and I get 50 mile an hour traffic continuously, and it makes you crazy. But I, I understand what you're saying. At the same time, as mayor, I can appreciate the fact we have Purdue Cal here, and that's a blessing in a lot of ways, you know, because it's one of our major employers in the city. But so please maybe touch base with Officer Holberg if you don't mind, ma'am. Thank you. Any other questions about Purdue Cal traffic, anything like that, right over here? Hi, um, on May 5th, voting day, I vote at Purdue uh, on Woodmar, just south of 169th. Yes, sir, that's, I, you my, probably that's my precinct. Yeah. Um, a few years ago, they made the Purdue side no parking ever, which is no problem. You know, you then parked on the residential side. Now the residential side, the west side, is no parking between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m., no exceptions except on Sunday and holidays. Where do you legally park to vote? Um, I always the, people, park in, the people inside had no clue. I park, first off, when I vote there, I think on election day, I think what they're talking about is a general rule. On election day, park in the circle. They're not going to tell you by the time you vote and get yeah, out. I mean, that's illegal too. That's what they said, just park in the circle. But okay. That's what I would tell you. I parked on the street. You yeah. know. I parked on the street, but then there's the possibility that you're towed, right? It would be 
Well, I'm not showing you on election day, I can tell you that. But, uh, but I mean, I understand what you're saying. And I think as a general rule, they don't want cars parking on that side of the street, like during a normal business day with Purdue and all the traffic going up and down Woodmar. But on election day, things are a little bit different. And, and parking in the circle, things, and you know, you have precinct committeemen there. And I think parking in the circle is totally appropriate. I understand. On election but then, day. Isn't that kind of odd, though, that both sides of the street are no parking? Well, you have to be careful around Purdue because these students have to pay a fee to park in the parking lot and everybody wants to save a couple bucks. So what they do is they invade the neighborhood. So it gives our Hamlet police officer something to ticket for if there's a Purdue student. Is that why we do that, JD? Yeah, many of our uh, public schools are the same way. Um, just to curb parking in the neighborhood because it gets so inundated in some of the, Clark, for example. Mm -hmm. It's a, right. the, the school's literally in a neighborhood, not on a main drag. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, if the students park there, the juniors and the seniors, then the, the residents have nowhere to park. So that's why the councilmen enact residential parking. Yeah, so, and I know that Purdue Cal in particular, you know, especially in like August when school starts, parking is such a major issue here. I mean, the parking lots fill up, and the first place they want to go is Woodmar, where that last, uh, you know, or Wicker, they'll park their car across the street right by the young lady's house. and. And we got to stop that too. So that's why it's so restrictive. But I understand what you're saying about election day. But on election day, I've seen people pull, uh, pull in the circle and park, and I don't think anybody's ever had a problem with that, sir. Thank, thank you for the question. Thanks. Any other questions about Purdue Cal? It seems like is the topic parking issues around Purdue Cal. But that was good news. What I brought up about Brian Miller, former chief of police, is now the Purdue Cal chief of police, and that's obviously great for Brian and his family. But it's also great for us because. You know, for those that live in this area, we're sort of under a double umbrella. You know, we have now out to Dowling Park, Purdue Calumet police monitor this whole area, obviously this campus, all the way out to Dowling Park because those facilities are eventually going to be part of the Purdue campus. We're working out the details on that as we speak. But so this is like a separate umbrella with a separate police force. Purdue Cal has the legal rights to pull over anybody in this neighborhood, right? I mean, theoretically, they could pull, if you're over by Hesso Park, could they pull you over there too? Yeah, they're, uh, Purdue is a sworn police officer in the state of Indiana, and that's why they're able to act off campus, and, and they're, they're usually pretty diligent about that, and uh, especially when they see that it's a, uh, a student of theirs. So if they, they, pull, if they pull over a non-student, you know, do they have the right, they don't have the right ticket or anything, right? They do. They do, actually. They go to the uh, Indiana Police Academy. Do they usually call for backup on a case like that, or do they do it themselves? If, if they call in to stop, they're on a different radio system than us. If they... If they feel the need, then they will call a Hammond police officer over as backup. Uh, they're not required to automatically, but if they see, feel there's a threat, then they would. But they are able to act independently. Okay. All right. Good question. Yes, sir. Yeah. What's uh, Hammond's emergency evacuation plan? Chicago is supposed to go to uh, Valpo University, so it's. There's an emergency on the east side of uh, Chicago. Are they going to be going through Hammond or what? And what is our off? Uh, what are what are our options? Because we've got these uh, uh, these defective railroad cars that they got 2017 with hazardous material, and we get stopped by them all the time. There can be 100, 130 of these cars on one train. Anybody? Kevin Margrave? Uh -huh. <laughs> I had to look for somebody. Hey, Kevin, how's it going? It sounds to me like uh, that was a question about what would we do if a train blew up in Hammond? It had a bunch of flammable material on it and issues like that. Okay. All right. Is it on or no? Okay, here we go. All right, we got. Of our um, if, if you're looking for an exact science in regards to evacuation, uh, there's a lot of different factors that, that will blend into which way, which direction uh, we would have via community go. Uh, we look at these scenarios, obviously we read the news, uh, we, we train, and uh, like I said, there's a lot of different factors that's going to determine which way we go. I mean, if it's something that is um, small in scale, we in the past, have utilized the Hammond Civic Center initially. Some of the schools are in 
cooperation with us to use as um, uh, safe places uh, in the in the short term. Uh, in regards to uh, a lot of the uh, train derailments that we've seen in the news, um, is that a worry for us? Sure it is. Um, but it's not an exact science, but it, as far as um, uh, the fire department, the police department, all the other city departments doing everything they can to make sure the community is safe, and um, we, we, we can do that. And we have uh, confidence in, in our abilities to make that happen. Okay. JD? We, we've done some of this in the past with the flooding, the major flood, where we've had to evacuate areas. Um, both the, the fire chief's correct. It's a lot of common sense. Most of this stuff is just common sense and you react to it as it happens. However, um, most of the fire staff and the upper police staff um, have received federal training. Uh, we have federal action we can um, institute should something really go wrong. And uh, we operate the same way the major flooding that happened in Louisiana, for example. Um, so we have federal federal assistance available. If it was something really bad, they would come in, um, and we already know how to operate under their guidelines um, for command and, command and procedures, and we would work hand-in-hand -hand with them to handle the problem if it was bigger than what we could immediately assess and handle ourselves. When we had the flood, I mean, like you, you brought up the flood, and I think Hamlin reacted very well during the flood. It wasn't any pre, pre-written rules about what we're going to do if we run into a flood. It was just... Like you said, common sense, right? Correct, and I think that's our, it's the biggest event I've been involved in for sure. And, and we handled it a, as it arrived mm -hmm. uh, on the ground. Right. We, um, city, fire, police all worked together yep. and we handled Public it very works, well. Engineering, everybody was out there. I mean, you know, and it was like, yeah, like you said, common sense at the time. And, you know, at the time we had everybody working, we had everybody working for a few days straight. Anyone had to? You know, I think the train situation's a little over, a little overblown because I know I've been with the city for like 40 years, and I could only think of one event like that when there, you know, when there was a train that came off the tracks right near Holman Avenue on the CSX tracks, and it burrowed into the ground, and it, and it actually cut one of Nipsco's gas pipelines, and I, I don't think there was anybody injured there. That was pretty much handled by our fire department. There was some damage to uh, one adjacent building, but they but they kept it localized and they kept everything pretty much on the on the railroad right away. I know what he's talking about is the uh, crude oil, the tar sands that are that are being brought down from Canada, taken to the BP refinery for uh, processing. There's an awful lot of rail cars traveling through the city now, but I don't think it's that big of a problem. I think uh, there's been some new rules that have come out. They're gonna make changes in the rail cars. Uh, so I think that's that's something that we need to be vigilant on, but I don't, you know, I don't think it's a major issue. Okay, Any follow up. Okay, let's do the next question. Okay, the next question is for engineering. Is a bike trail being built along Holman and Sheffield? Great question. Um, one of the most dangerous parts of the Erie Lackawanna Trail that goes all the way up to basically the Wolf Lake Trail, George Lake Trail, Whiting Bike Trail, is the stretch between downtown Hammond and 129th in, in Robertsdale. Um, one of the things that Stan and I have been working on for a long time is how to try to make that safer. And Stan, do you want to talk a little bit about the right of way between the river and the trailer court? And then I can talk a little bit about the trailer court getting us up to 129th. Yeah. The, uh the Sheffield Avenue project from 129 down to the Nipsco Trail, which is about 135th, we are narrowing Sheffield down slightly. It's going to be a three-lane section, and we're going to build a separate dedicated bike trail. Uh, that's a that's a dangerous section of roadway because people have a tendency to drive faster than the speed limit through there, and we felt that the only safe way to build a uh, a, a bicycle trail that that's going to be heavily used is to build it off of the street. And there wasn't enough room to build it on the uh, uh, shoulder of the roadway without narrowing down the street. We, uh, we got 80% federal money for that project. So Sheffield Avenue is actually gonna, it's gonna get an overlay, it's gonna get new curbs on one side, and then we're gonna have the trail. So then that's gonna connect the section of trail that presently goes down to Nipsco right away from Sheffield Avenue over to Calumet. Now we got funded the next leg of that, which is going to cross Calumet at the traffic signal, 
and then it's gonna it's gonna go in front of that large vacant parcel south of John L's restaurant, and then it's gonna travel down the Nipsco right away, all the way down to 150th Street, and it's gonna tie into a a future trail over in East Chicago that's gonna be on the Grand Cal River. Uh, we got a federal grant for that section too, so it's 80 uh, 80 percent federal. We've We've pretty much built all of our trails off street because those are the safest and and we like you know parents to feel that it's safe to send their kids out on the bike trail. Right. That doesn't happen very often, but it's still <laughs> but it's still happening. Uh, now I now I lost my train of thought. Why don't we just run? Yeah, yeah, we've been building them off off street. Did you want to make a comment on that, Tom? Yeah, um, between the trailer court and if you look at Sheffield, Sheffield used to be a four lane street. Uh, and what we're doing is reducing it down to a three lane street and we're gonna have one dedicated bike trail along the lane. It's gonna be segregated by a, a curb between the bike trail and, sorry, like I've totally lost my train of thought. This has been sort of a screwed up event so far. We got some static in the background. I would rather just get rid of that and just keep running like we were. But either that or we could just yell. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Okay, the last, the last question is about uh, Nick D's meeting minutes and strategic plan. The what? Hey, I'm Max. How's it going? Hope you uh, talk loud today. Okay. Uh, you brought something up earlier about the RDA. And I, yes, like to, uh, I see a lot of council people here. And uh, the existing South Shore train runs a $13 million deficit. And if you write down the council people, look up NICTD meeting minutes for 2015. That, they'll show you that, uh, that South Shore train now runs at a $13 million deficit. If you Google NICT strategic plan of 2014 and go to page 18, that the train, the South Shore extension could have a possible gas tax, wheel tax, option tax, and that's written by Bill Hanna. And if, if the train does come up, the South Shore extension and it's built, then if it does run into a deficit, we're probably gonna have that optional gas tax, because we can see that the South Shore is running, you know, deficit. Now the RDA uh, this year during Bill 1618, uh, written by Hal Slager, sponsored by Ed Soliday, was to put all the RDA money for the train. at six million dollars. So the, our seated portion from all the cities is 11.5 million. You times that by 30 years, that's 525 million. I've, I've, got a, I've got a problem with the Congress, Congressman Viskovsky's math. If local tax money is, is $525 million and the cost of the train was $571 million, Pete's only going to get $50 million in, in federal funding unless he's gonna, he can get $525 million. That train will be over a billion. And you know, you mentioned uh, Governor Rauner. Rauner has a problem with the Amtrak. That's why people are here, coming flee into Indiana. We're catching them with a catcher's mitt. Rauner has put $42 million into the Amtrak for state funding. Ron, Governor Rauner wants to cut that $26 million to get uh, $16 million not to subsidize the Amtrak. And I hope the council people Google those links, and we don't want to be like Illinois. You know what? We've got a train. If we didn't have it, I've got nothing against public transportation. I do have a problem with Hal Sawyer and Ed Soliday not, not putting in that bill, 1618, they got put in with Bill 101 uh, because of the common uh, con repeal of the common <coughs> construction wage. Our local people, union and non-union, will not get that work. You know, life's a negotiation, and Congressman Vosfosky should have put it in that bill to use American Steel. Got a big problem with this train, and when it's up, are we going to put our future generation in debt forever? 
That's what I got to say. Well, I appreciate the question um, for the statement. Not, not necessarily a question, but you know, the, the train concept is interesting. You know, I think if you ask people, hey, we want to expand this train line from Hammond all the way down to Dyer, what do you think about that? I think a lot of people would say, you know, that's a good idea when you say it's going to cost anywhere from 600 to $700 million and you're going to have to pay for it out of your taxes and you may have to subsidize the line every year. That's where it starts getting more interesting. You know, and uh, the congressman's pushing real hard on this. Our local newspaper is pushing real hard on this. Real hard. Um, Congressman Pete was on the South Shore tracks today handing out information about the train line. He's like campaigning on this issue right now, and he's not on, a, on the ballot. He's literally, I think he realizes Hammond residents are sort of, I, you know, against slash on the fence on this issue, and I think he's campaigning like he's running for office uh, on this issue. So it's a great issue for us to talk about without microphones. <laughs> So, Joe, do you have a question? Sure. Domain. That's what I'm talking about. I forgot the name. Thank you. All right. um, it was interesting during the Amtrak debate, the Times had an editorial a couple weeks ago, and I was going to cut and paste it and put it on the internet. I decided not to because it was before the election. But basically, wow, that sounds great, whatever you just did. That was great. Whatever you guys just did worked. Sounds so much better. Um, in that article, the Times admitted that no commuter rail line in America operates without subsidies. So what you're saying, MX, is absolutely true. What they're talking about right now with the cost of the train is the cost of the line itself to get it out to Dyer. Every single year, that train's going to be running at a deficit. It's not going to make money, and we're going to have to subsidize the deficit as well. And let's just go in with our eyes wide open. That's all I'm saying. And there's not too many people. Everybody, the best thing, best career move for your mayor would be to fall in line and the Times would love me and they'd put all kinds of great newspaper articles out there about me because I said, I think this is great and I think we should do this. We should spend $27 million on this project. That would be the easy thing to do. The hard thing to do is what we're doing. The council and the mayor passed a resolution that said we will not provide any funding for this project until we know answers. $27 million. What do you get for the $27 million if, if we sign on right now? Do you get a station in Hammond? I don't know. Is there going to be a freight on that line? I don't know. What's the route going to be, Mayor? I don't know. How many stations are going to be? I don't know. Is it electric or diesel? I don't know. Are there going to be flyovers? I don't know. Eminent domain? I don't know. How much do you, do you want? $27 million. It's ridiculous. If Bill Taylor or Africa Tarver came up to me and said, Mayor, I want you to spend $27 million on this economic development project. I said, okay, tell me about it, Africa. She says, I can't. I said, how many jobs is it going to create? I don't know. You know, how much of an investment? It's going to be great. I don't know. You know, where is it going to locate? Can't tell you. How much do you need again? $27 million. What would, you, what would you say to Africa in that case? Say, I can't do this. I have to answer to the taxpayers when I spend $27 million. I can't answer your questions because we don't know the answer to them. And yet, this entire county has signed on to this project and said, we'll give you millions of dollars over, over 30 years, and they don't know the answers to it. I think the Hammond Council and the Hammond Mayor are the ones that are being rational and reasonable, but we're being painted as the villains because we didn't just sign on and get all the good press that comes along with it. So it's a, it's a tough issue. I think it's going to happen. I really do. The state of Indiana signed on. They don't know the answers either. The state of Indiana committed, gosh, 10 million a year, over 30 years, $300 million. So the state of Indiana is in, you know, federal government's in, they want all of us to be in, if we're all in. And then what happens if there's a cost overrun? Well, we gotta come up with that money somehow. Does that mean we raise the local option income tax? Probably. The food and beverage tax, who knows? I mean, I, you know, it's a tough issue. 
but the Congress is pushing real hard for it. And it's funny, the people that are playing ball right now have a tendency to get federal money for other projects. Like uh, Gary signs on, and then Gary gets this transit-oriented development, like a $10 million project from Congressman Pete. I, haven't, I can't tell you the last time I've seen something like that happen in Hammond. We don't really get a lot of, I know we get federal money for road projects, but we don't get little gifts that other cities seem to get a lot of, and we don't. Maybe it's because we're not signing on to the South Shore. I don't know. Anybody have any issues on this they want to bring up? Any questions from the audience? Seems like our amplifier is, or the, uh, the sound system is taking care of itself now. Okay. Do we have any more questions? We do not. This has been one of the most memorable Mary Nights ever. Um, usually this doesn't happen, and I'm so glad it's going to be recorded on Go Hammond TV so we can watch it again. But I want to thank everybody for coming out. I want to thank the department heads for coming out. I want to remind you the next Mayor's Night Out is scheduled for Wednesday, August 26th at Eggers Middle School. That's going to be in Hammond's third district. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out. I want to thank Councilman Michael Pinker. Oh, Harold, how's it going? Yes, sir. Honor of our Memorial Day. Yes, sir. I'd like to render up a little homage to the Mayor of Hammond. Patriotic medley. I'd love that. It's, it would be a perfect way to close it. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains, majesties. Above the fruited plains, America, America, God shed his grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. mountains, through the prairie, to the ocean, white with foam, God bless America, my home, sweet home, God bless America, my home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Thank you, everybody, for coming to Mayor's Night Out, 5th District. I want to thank Councilman Mike. I want to thank Purdue County Met, Chancellor Thomas.